children as we possibly can, and to teach them the songs and the hymns and the Word of God, and to teach them faithfulness, teach them uh, to be today what they need to be for the rest of, their, of our lives. You're not responsible for generations after you're not here any longer. You don't, you're not responsible for preaching the gospel in a generation that you don't live in. Well, we are responsible for making sure that the gospel is proclaimed in our generation, in our time. And we need God's help to do that. And it takes a concerted effort of a church to reach the to reach its community. And one of the most valuable, one of the greatest returns on investment is children. And you just cannot imagine how much it transforms the direction, the trajectory of a life by reaching a child uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got some fantastic kids. We've got a number of kids right now, I think three or four, that have not yet trusted Jesus as their Savior. So pray for the kids' church when they meet on Sunday mornings. And pray for the Sunday school class. They're preaching the gospel back there, and they're teaching them uh, teaching them the same kind of things that we teach in the adult church service. And so pray for these kids to come to know the Lord Jesus. And then invest in their lives. Feel free, if you're in the service, and you see the kids sitting on the front rows or whatever, feel free to sit, uh, sit with the kids on Sunday mornings. We like to have them in the front row. And the reason for that is because it's the best place to pay attention and not be distracted by anything else. I know I, I can't stand sitting in the back row when I go to church because you see everything everybody does that is distracting. You know, when the cute little kid is is uh, turns around, stands on the seat, looks back at you, and you got somebody going ah, like this. You know what that looks like to pastor when I mean, you got people going like this from the seats and so forth. And uh, you see all this distraction, so it won't hurt you. But, but uh, invest in our kids' lives. And if you want to be involved in ministry at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, we want to involve you. There's, there are places for ministry. Right now we're trying to do a better job with our special music, and with our choirs and singing groups. We're trying to have more uh, Christ-honoring music and more deliberate worship in that area in our church. And so we could use you. We try to meet at 515 before the evening service, and that is always contingent on how quickly we get back from our services in Miami Beach. So as long as we're here on time, it starts at 515, but we do have music practice every Sunday evening, and so please come early and, and be part of that, participate in that, and uh, help us to be able to do a better job worshiping in that way. And then as far as our kids go, we just could use so much more help with our church workers than what we currently have. So please be aware of that, pray about it, and uh, Ask, ask, what could I do? Maybe you'd say, well, I'm not really good at, well, trust me, you could be good at something that is needed in the kids' ministry. So, that's it. Uh, Matthew, we turn to chapter 21, and I'm going to, uh, I want to just, just read, because of the Sunday that this is, this is not our text today, but I want to read about Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And so I would, I would uh, like to, 
do that. Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 21. The Bible says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, <laughs> saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he'll send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them on their clothes, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that has come in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. My friend, Jesus is the king, isn't he? And it was certainly fitting that he would ride into Jerusalem as king. But how many kings would ride into a city and receive the homage of the people in order to die for the people, for the sins of the people? And that's the nature of our king. Well, please go to Matthew chapter 13. You say, Pastor, you should preach a message on Palm Sunday about uh, Palm Sunday. Well, sometimes I do when the Lord leads, but actually right now we've uh, been praying about in, in advance uh, several messages as we're preaching through Matthew and don't want to get stuck in a rut of this is the day and this is what we have to do on this day and certainly there is not meant to take anything away from the celebration that today actually is and so I don't want you to misunderstand that but we're going to be in the scripture here and I want to read our text this morning and actually I would just like to read two verses we'll pray and then we'll kind of fill in all the missing information in our context. If you'll look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10, then the Bible says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Go to verse 17. Uh, verse 16, I, mean, I intend. I want to read 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Well, Father, I pray that you would show us why it is that some have seen and not believed, and some uh, do not see and yet believe. And I pray that from the Scripture this morning that you would open our eyes and our hearts that, Lord, we would be hearers of the Word, we would be believers, and that we would understand how to preach the Gospel in light of it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this is the same day that Jesus had gone into the synagogue. And last week we had looked at Christ in the synagogue and the response of, of uh, the Jews to Jesus. And that we had begun by the uh, disciples eating corn on the Sabbath day, if you remember that, and then the unbelieving Jews looking for reasons to accuse Jesus. One of those reasons being that they wanted to know whether or not Jesus would heal a man on the Sabbath day. Remember that? man had a withered hand. And Jesus told them, based on your own law, your law says that if you had, uh, if you had a, a, a lamb or an oxen or a sheep and it was in a ditch on the Sabbath day, you wouldn't wait a day to get him out. And he explained the purpose of the Sabbath and that the Son of Man was Lord of the Sabbath. And so he told the man to stretch forth his hand. He healed the man on the Sabbath day. Jesus is surrounded by individuals who are very, very religious. They're obviously in a place of religion celebrating their religious day. And they were doing it as a religion and not as though the day had a purpose for them. Of course, their purpose in celebrating the Sabbath was that it had become a religious exercise rather than a day of rest. And Jesus responded to them very, very scathingly. And we'll be able to preach last week's message again. We won't have time for that. 
But Jesus has left the religious crowd. And in verse 1 of chapter 13, the Bible says the same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And in verse uh, 2, and great multitudes were gathered unto him so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And so now Jesus has gone out of the place where the religious people are and he's gone to a withdrawn place where people that are actually seeking him are at. And so we will say about the, the multitude that is surrounding Jesus that Jesus didn't go to where they were at, they went to where he was. And I think that's significant, isn't it? When Jesus went into the synagogue, there would have been individuals in that place that would have been there regardless of whether he was there or not. He went to them. In this instance, Jesus has withdrawn himself and he's on the seashore and a multitude comes to him and so he uh, creates a pulpit, if you will, a platform to preach from and it's a, it's a ship. And so they have the ship just go out a little bit, give him some space so that he can address the people and he's on the ship and he begins to speak to the people and here's what Jesus said to them. Here's the message. He spake many things unto them in parables saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, verse 4, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Now, I want to read that verse again, verse 9 again. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Now that little interjection is not simply there because, you know, there needed to be some filler space in the Word of God. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Isn't it so? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so verse 9 actually is a significant, or it signifies really the purpose of what Jesus was teaching here. In other words, Jesus is teaching an important lesson that you've probably, uh, let me pull the audience real, really quickly. How many of you have heard messages explaining the parable of the sower? Most of us have, right? Most of us have heard messages explaining the parable of the sower. We want to overlook that message. But actually Jesus had on his heart a deeper, more important message than the parable of the sower. And so Jesus is speaking to the multitudes, everybody that's there, the multitude that came out to him. Now, what would be the motives of the multitude for coming? Well, I think that we could say that not everyone would have the same purpose, wouldn't you? In other words, today in this church, if God knowing your heart and you uh, as much as you can know your own heart, were to express the reason that you're under the preaching of the Word of God today, we wouldn't have identical purpose, right? We could all say worship here this morning, and I think that that would probably represent 100%. But there are purposes, there are reasons why each of us are here today, actually, beyond simply that, isn't it so? There would be some variety, and that would be true of the crowd that came to Jesus. So for me to make a blanket statement and lump all of the multitudes that came to the seashore into one category would be not quite fair, wouldn't it? If I were to say, they all came because they needed to be healed, and that's the only reason they came, would that be true of some? Yes. be true of some, but would it be true of all? <coughs> no, with the exception of that would be the disciples, wouldn't it be? The disciples didn't come to be healed, they were following Jesus. And so it wouldn't be true of them at the very least. And I think it would be not true of every person there. If we said, you remember when Jesus said, you came to see me because you've eaten of the bread of the loaves that I fed you and were filled. You came because you wanted bread. You heard there was bread and you came to get the bread. And I am the bread of life, but you want physical bread. And that's why you've come. Would that be true of some? Perhaps so. But would it be true of all? No, it wouldn't. And so we can say that there was a variety in purpose. I will say this. I don't know, I don't know of any individual that was there. They're not spoken of in an individual, uh, in, in, as, as individuals. They're talked about as part of multitude. But individuals make up multitudes, don't they? And so individually they came for different reasons. But Jesus has something on his heart. And so the, all the multitudes that came to Jesus, he told them the parable of the sower. 
I would say expect many things, but one of the things he told them about was the sower. He talked about seed and the different kind of ground that seed falls on. And obviously there was the ideal and there was the less than ideal and there was the opposite of ideal and so forth. And that's all Jesus told them. Now how much sense without the explanation of what Jesus is talking about is a parable? I can hardly relate to not understanding the parable of the sower because I've heard it preached all my life. Not just my adult life, but I, I, I mean, I memorized the parable of the sower when I was a kid. And I heard it preached when I was a child. And so I've heard the parable of the sower preached most of my life. And so it's hard for me to relate to Jesus standing up and saying, here's the parable of the sower. And then when he gets done, that's the end of the story. He gives an illustration, but he doesn't ever explain what it illustrates. Doesn't ever say, this is what I'm saying. He ne never elaborates on it. And so the disciples came to him and they asked him a question. Why are you speaking to the people in parables? Why are you talking to people in terms that they cannot understand? I mean, Jesus at times was very direct, wasn't he? Oh, generation of vipers, he'd say to the Pharisees. He, he said to the individuals who accused the woman, uh, he said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus was very, very direct at times, wasn't he? Sometimes Jesus would answer uh, indirectly, but most of the time Jesus, or much of the time, Jesus was very specific in answering the questions that were asked. And in this case, he's teaching the people, and he has a multitude there. And humanly speaking, as far as I'm concerned as a preacher, when I see a group that's there, I think, you know what, I need to preach the most clear, the simplest message of the gospel that I possibly can. And here Jesus, having that same opportunity, preaches a parable about seed that's sown, and some of it's good, some of it's bad, and that's the end of the story. And it's good for us to reflect on that, isn't it? Did Jesus not understand the platform that he had on that boat that day? Did he not understand the opportunity that he had to preach to individuals that were seekers that day? Well, friend... I promise you that Jesus knows more than I do about anything. And Jesus knew more than the disciples did about anything, and it confused them. They said, why do you do this? In verse 10, the Bible says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Jesus said, Because that was a message for you, but not for them. Now that's rather exclusive, isn't it? Isn't that Jesus kind of saying, well, you know, this is for the in crowd and they're the out crowd. And boy, I'll tell you, all of a sudden you're starting to think, man, Jesus doesn't have compassion. Is this the same Jesus that saw the multitudes that were scattered as sheep without a shepherd and He had compassion on them? Well, it is the same Jesus. But it's also the same Jesus that understands what's in the heart of men. And here is exposing what is in the heart of man. He said, unto you it's given to understand. Now, how did the disciples understand the parable? Jesus explained, Jesus explained it to them. In other words, they didn't understand because Jesus spoke in parables and they all sat there and said, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Get that, John? Uh -huh. yeah, same thing I got, mm-hmm. They all compared notes afterward, all the disciples, and they said, yeah, exactly what I was thinking Jesus was saying. No, they didn't have a clue what Jesus was saying any more than the multitudes that were there. Now listen, I'm going to share with you a truth today. It's not a deep one. The difference between the disciples and the multitudes was the question they asked. What are you talking about? Why are you doing this? This week, perhaps and next week are perhaps the most appropriate time to mention that there are a lot of people who are comforted by religion with no understanding. Isn't it true? In other words, for sure next Sunday morning, because it's going to be what we call Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, attendance will be greater than it is the rest of the year. Sadly, it's, it'll be down from what it's ever been in the past, probably. But attendance in the United States of America 
will be greater than it is the rest of the year as far as religious services go. And there will be churches full of people that have no intention of anything beyond feeling good about going to church. In other words, anybody ever watch Andy Griffith? Am I the only Andy Griffith person here today? Anybody watch Andy Griffith? And you, ever, you enjoy the conversations after. I like the church services where they have the conversation. You always have Barney making up what the pastor talked about. You know, it's great you talked about sin today, Pastor. It had nothing to do with what, you know, it, it evidence that he was sleeping through the entire service and didn't know what it was about. You know, we don't really anymore have a culture where everyone goes home on Sunday afternoon and discusses the truth that was taught in the service, do we? I mean, it's just not even in our culture anymore. Even in Christianity, we're just so hurried and we're so busy that after the service is over on Sunday morning, we don't go home and say, well, what do you, what do you make of what the, what the message was about today and people discuss and talk about it? The fact of the matter is, is that this next week, probably most people, again, this is just a generic, I'm not talking about every person, just the same way I said I'm not talking about every person at the seashore, but next week, mostly, you could preach Dr. Seuss. I'm serious. You could, you could draw an analogy about something from the cat in the hat. And people will go home and have no problem with that. Matter of fact, I've seen it. Some years ago, I, I was so impressed by a terrible, and terrible messages impressed me. Uh, good messages I'll probably forget, but terrible ones I probably never will. And I, I have four or five terrible messages I've heard in my life, and I can just remember the whole thing. But some years ago, I went to the, I don't know, I'll go ahead and say where it was. It was the First Baptist Church of Tallahassee, downtown Tallahassee, on a Sunday morning, and I went to the worship service there. And the preacher who was there at the time preached a sermon on Pandora's box. And he never read Scripture, never alluded to Scripture, but he told the story of Pandora's box. And you know the story of Pandora's box, right? It's an analogy on how, it basically, it's, it's a, kind of a human parable on how sin got into the world, everything evil was in the box, and when it was opened up, then the world was never the same after Pandora opened the box, right? So he told the story of it, and then he said, that every one of us are like Pandora's box, that we just need to be opened up in order to be able to blossom and shine. And I thought, you don't even know what Pandora's box is about. <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're preach, I mean, the message was so bad that it wasn't the Bible that was preached, it was Pandora's box for a sermon. I'm sorry, but that's a lacking sermon. I, I can understand something you being used to illustrate something, but that's all he preached. He didn't preach any Bible, he preached Pandora's box. And then he didn't even get Pandora's box right. Didn't even get the story right. And I thought, I don't know what you did last night, but you didn't prepare to preach the gospel. And you know something? You could do that across America and nobody would notice. Or few would notice. Isn't that true? Yeah. But wouldn't there be some people that came hungry with a desire to hear truth? Wouldn't there be some people that would leave disappointed by that nonetheless? Of course, you came to church this morning and Pastor Price preached the Pandora's Box sermon, which I'd love to do sometime, just for fun. <laughs> and you were to leave here today and you say, you know, I really went there today hoping God would talk to me. I don't know what that was, but I don't think that was God. You would be distinguishing yourself from an individual that doesn't have ears to hear and someone who does. By the way, that was like 15 years ago. I don't think it's the same pastor there. I don't even know what Sunday it was. So it's a very, even though I gave you specifics, it's a very generic. My wife could probably tell you exactly when it was, but it's insignificant. Just, it was an illustration. Okay, listen to me, friend. This past month, I've had several individuals that I preached the gospel to, and they had expressed willingness to let God interfere in their lives. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, they said, well, if God can prove to me that He's God, and if Jesus will just save me, then go ahead, God. Now, that's something, isn't it? Being open to God just saving you. There's another person saying, okay, you know what? I don't believe there's a God. And I'm not sure I believe that Jesus saves, and I'm not sure if the whole spiritual thing is real. But if God wants to override my beliefs, 
then he's free and welcome to do so. And I know of instances where God has actually done that, don't you? Where a person has almost been set on not believing, and yet God has interfered and he's shown them truth. But you know this passage of Scripture is actually teaching that God, that's not really God's character. That isn't really the way that the gospel works. God doesn't force somebody into faith or belief. Now there are doctrines that teach forced conversion. They teach that, you know, before the foundation of the world, God has determined, predetermined, who is going to receive Jesus as their Savior. And so really, no matter what you do, and I know you say, Pastor, you're, you're not representing it accurately. You can't. You cannot accurately represent Calvinism because no Calvinist believes it exactly the same way. But generally speaking, they believe that God sovereignly determines before a person is born who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, and that everything else is just circumstances that lead up to it. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is contradicting that completely. See, Jesus here says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the word is a word of permission. And a word of permission opens it up for an individual to make a determination or a choice on their own. And Jesus is saying to these individuals who have been, have been preached this parable that nobody can understand, that makes no sense at all. He's saying, if you want to hear, go ahead. If you want to hear, I'll tell you what it means. And here he is, he is determining or he is identifying a distinct difference between people who want to hear and people who do not. See, you could say on the basis of the fact that everybody by their own choice went down to the seashore that everyone wanted to hear, but actually it wasn't true. Actually, not everyone there wanted to hear the truth. You say, well, I don't know why they were there, Pastor. Well, I don't know for every person, but I know there were a variety of reasons that had less to do with, I need truth. I need to know Jesus. I want God, and I don't care what the truth is, I'm committed to it. And here Jesus in His statement of, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear is saying, commit to the truth. Make a commitment to say, God, I'm going to know the truth. And I'm going to be satisfied with nothing but the truth. I will settle for nothing less than the truth. And I am wholly committed to whatever it is applying or doing it in my life. See, it's a message about the application of the truth. Some falls on stony ground. What happens? It doesn't even take root. Some falls on uh, thorny ground. What happens? What well, takes root and gets choked out. And some find, falls on good ground. And what happens to it? Well, it produces fruit. And there's an application there, and it has to do with the heart. But it begins with, do you even want to hear? What kind of ground are you? And here Jesus is explaining to his disciples, the reason I'm speaking in parables is because I'm talking to people that don't care if they hear or not. And why cast pearls before swine? That's the analogy. Why give truth to someone who's going to do nothing with it? Now listen to me, Christian. Why give truth to someone who's going to do nothing with it? You preach the gospel to a lost person, and it'll have the purpose of a witness against them when they stand before God for rejecting it, and that'll be all it is. If a person rejects the gospel, it'll be a witness against them when they are judged for whether or not they receive Christ. It's not a lot of good, is it? They'll still be condemned either way. Why preach truth to someone who's going to do nothing with it? Now, let's ask the question, practically speaking, because of the audience that Jesus is now addressing. The disciples. Why preach the truth to disciples who will do nothing with it? What good is truth for an individual that hears it and says, Ah, oh, that's true. And yet does nothing with it. My friend, if the gospel has no effect, why hear it? Why preach it? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying today, well, you know, we should determine, we shouldn't preach the gospel to somebody that doesn't want to hear. <laughs> I don't know what's in the heart of men. Jesus did. There's a big difference between Pastor Price, who's commanded to go and preach the gospel to every creature. 
and Jesus who know, knew what was in the heart of men. Isn't there? Do you see that clear distinction? I hope you do. I'm nothing like Jesus, my friend. The only areas I'm like Jesus is because of Jesus. So I don't make a determination who to preach truth to, who to share truth with. But I can say that it would be possible on the basis of the example we have here for individuals to be in this place today for reasons other than hearing truth and living it out in their lives. Matter of fact, it's greater than possible, actually, isn't it? It's probably likely. Here's a way for you to determine about the person that's sitting in your seat this morning what their motive is. Why'd you come? Why are you here? You know, many days on the Lord's Day, on, on, on Sunday, I'll be honest with you, Sundays are just wonderful for me. Every Sunday is like a holiday for me. It's a hard day. It's a work day. My Sunday begins at 6. It usually ends about midnight normally. And it's, it's just go, 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 go. Interact with people the whole day. Every single Sunday. I don't get a Sunday nap. Uh, when we get out of church here, we go to church in Miami Beach. When we get out of church in Miami Beach, we come up here and go to church, and then we fellowship afterward. And, you know, we, something's going on the whole day. It's a busy day for me. But when I get up on Sundays, I feel pretty good, to be honest with you, because it's a holiday. Anthony and I were walking over to get donuts at Safeway this morning, and I, we just had a bounce in our step. We were just happy. Why are we happy? Because this is the day that we worship God. And so it's the Lord's Day for us. It's a special day. It really is. You know, there's a big difference, though, between when I get up on Sunday morning and I say, God, I want, I want you to speak to me today. And God does. God uses my own preaching to speak to me. He gives me conviction for my own preaching on the Lord's Day a lot of times. And uh, thrills my heart with truth and, and, and works in me to give me a resolve and a determination to respond to the truth. But there's a big difference between when I get up and say, God, I want you to, I, I'm open today. Whatever you want to tell me, I want to hear it. And whatever you say to me, I wish to do it. There's a major difference between when I come to hear the preaching of the Word of God with that kind of a mentality, or when I come because it's, I've got to be there. I've got to go to church. You heard the old, the, the old joke about the, the guy that woke up on Sunday morning, and uh, his, his wife woke him up and said, Hey, get up. It's time to go to church. He said, I don't feel like it today. don't want to go. And she said, Well, you need to get up anyway. And he said, well, I don't want to. I'm not going to. And she said, well, get up. You need to go to church. And he said, well, you give me one good reason why I ought to go to church today. And he said, she said, well, because you're the pastor. <laughs> I don't go to church because I'm the pastor on the Lord's Day, to be honest with you. I go to church because I'm a believer. And it really is, I understand I'm a pastor. I understand the effect it would have on our church if your pastor didn't want to be here on Sunday morning. It would be, have a, a terrible effect, would it not? But there's more to it than that. See, I want to have ears to hear. I want to worship God. I want to participate in the things that a church is supposed to do. Psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms and singing and making melody in our hearts. And Lord, I want to fellowship with the believers. I want to be under the preaching of the Word of God. I want to give God. Uh, I want to give in the offering and be part of that worship. And I want to give God uh, just my praise and my attention. I want to lift Him up and I want to publicly declare that He's worthy to be praised. I want to worship God. And more than that, I want God to meet with me. I want to meet with God. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And Jesus gave a quick description. In verse 11, He said, The reason I speak in parables is because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. Now, Jesus is not excluding them here. He's going to explain why. He said in verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Now, I don't know about you, but that verse out of context seems mean. Doesn't it? The person that has, you're going to give them more. And the person that doesn't have, you're going to take away the thing that they have. Okay? Now, that seems cruel to me. And out of context... It really does, doesn't it? It seems like Jesus is saying, if you've got a dollar, I'm going to take it. But if you've got a thousand dollars, then I'm going to give you another thousand. It's not what Jesus is saying at all. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so here Jesus is saying, he that hath ears to hear, give him more. Let him hear more. And he that hath not ears to hear, take away what he has, because it doesn't do him any good. See, what it, see the difference? That's context, isn't it? Is that what the Scripture is expressly stating? 
uh, my friend, it's very clear. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I'll give you the truth behind what I'm saying, but I won't give them the truth because it won't do them any good. Now let me ask you a question. What are these poor folks supposed to do? How are they supposed to know the truth? Well, pretty simple. They could say, what are you saying? They could ask. Isn't that so? In other words, they have Jesus. Remember that when, why was not this, you know, the ointment sold and the money given to feed the poor? And Jesus' explanation, the poor you have with you always, but me you have not always. They had Jesus. They could have asked Him. What do you mean? What are you saying? And here we have the example. The disciples said, why are you saying this? What are you saying? And Jesus explained to them why He was saying it and what He was saying. He said, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. He said in verse 14, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. That is Isaiah chapter 6, by the way, where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train, or his smoke, his glory filled the temple, and the, their, his, his train filled the temple, and he had the angels around him, and and uh, this is where Isaiah had this encounter with God where he said, Woe is me, for I am, a, uh, I am a, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a generation of unclean lips. Remember the angel took a, a tongue with a coal from the altar and cleansed his lips. And then God, then God said, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And then he said, Here's who I'm sending you to. I'm going to send you to a people... That hearing, they can hear, but they don't hear. And they can see, but they don't see. And they're just fine with a message because they actually don't care about what's being said. And friend, let me, let me just kindly suggest to you that if you came today saying, I'm going to hear something, but you don't intend to do anything about what you hear, you're the Isaiah 6. You're the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 6. Hearing they shall hear and not perceive. Seeing they shall see. Listen, you can see it, you can hear it, but if you don't, if, if the application of it is meaningless to you, what good is it? What good is it if you won't do what you've heard? For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Now who is responsible for closing the eyes and shutting the ears in this context? Did God do that to them? No, they did it to themselves. We could speak about motives for being closed-minded, couldn't we? But, I, but we couldn't cover them all. Maybe it's because there's something in an individual's life that they're not willing to have God interfere with. If I listen to what God says, He's going to take over my life. I don't trust God taking over my life. Or I like what I'm doing with my life and I don't want God to interfere in that. And so, if I see God in that way, it's going to affect how I see myself and I'll have to change. And so, shut my eyes, cover them up, because I don't want to see. And Jesus said, these people have seen and these people have heard. What did they see in here? Remember the message that Jesus sent back to tell John the Baptist? What was it? <laughs> the dead are raised. The blind receive their sight. Uh, the... Um, I should just, just read it in verse uh, 11, or chapter 11, uh, verse 5. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Preached to them. Okay, so what could anyone see watching Jesus? All these things he just described. Does that do anything for a believer? I think so. And here's the more important question. 
Does it do anything for an unbeliever? We would think so, wouldn't we? But the illustration that Jesus uses is when the is of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the rich man in hell? Lift up his eyes being in torments. What did he say? He said, send my brother, or send Lazarus to go back and tell my brother, my brethren, my five brothers, so that they don't have to come and be in this torment. What did Jesus say? They have Moses and the prophets. If they will not hear him, neither will he, they hear or them, neither will they hear him, though one will come back from the dead. Hear me this morning, please. If Jesus were to walk in this building this morning, I'm not speaking blasphemy, I'm talking about bodily presence. If Jesus Christ in His physical body, the way that He was on earth with these individuals, were to walk in this building this morning, He would have no more actual continued effect than this book does. That's not an exaggeration, that's not a hyperbole. I'm just telling you, if this book won't affect you, neither would Jesus Himself. And if you saw Jesus raise someone from the dead, you'd look at it and you'd explain it away some way. If you saw Jesus cast out devils, you'd say He casts out devils in the name of the devil. You'd make up a reason not to believe it because you don't have a heart to believe and you don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul contrasted the unbelief of the Jews and the unbelief of the Gentiles. He said the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. He said the Jews want you to do a miracle to prove it to them, but do they believe when you do a miracle? No. The Greeks want to have reasoning, but do they believe when they hear reasoning? No. Paul said, but we preach Christ, a stumbling block. Or to the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Your heart's attitude your willingness to believe will determine whether you do or not. Facts have nothing to do with it. You say, Pastor, then a person can believe anything. No, my friend. If you have a heart that's open to God's truth, and you have a mind that is willing to understand God's truth, you'll still have a brain. You'll be able to identify a lie. But you could see the truth right in front of your face. And if you don't have a heart to believe it, you will not. Period. Because, my friend, faith is a determined choice of the will. And that's precisely what Jesus is saying to His disciples. Truth won't affect you unless you'll <clears throat> receive it. <clears throat> Doctors will tell you that, won't they? <laughs> I don't really go to the doctor. I, I, I will someday. Either, either I'll die because I didn't go, or I'll go and it'll keep me from dying one or the other. I, I don't really go. I can't afford to, to be honest with you. I don't really go. And I, I, I'll know that I needed to go to the doctor when I die because I didn't or when I go when they help me. But I don't just go to the doctor. Some people too. I, I have friends that are doctors and they tell me all the time about people that come to them with problems and they, help, they, they give them a solution for their problem and then the people don't believe them. Now, I understand there are a lot of alternatives, sometimes to medication. Before I'd ever take a medication, I'd always see if there's something I could take instead because I don't want to get stuck on some medication or some drug or something like that. I understand that. But, friend, if you don't want the doctor's advice, don't go bothering them. Don't ask him. And the truth of the matter is, if you don't want to hear what Jesus has to say, why go down to the seashore? Now, we're not arguing that people did because they did, didn't they? Individuals came to hear Jesus, but they actually didn't want to hear Him. And individuals came to see Jesus, but they actually didn't want to see Him. And if that was true then, could it not be true that today in this small crowd that there would be individuals that came but don't want to hear and people that uh, see but they don't want to see, they don't want to perceive? Sure could, couldn't it? I'll tell you what, God's Spirit just goes on. And He gets me right in the heart. In verse 16, we see the alternative. In verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. There's a real blessing for a person that sees and a person who hears. 
Why does a person see and why does a person hear? Because they choose to. Because they choose to. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. What an example. There's all kinds of people who have believed that haven't seen what you've seen and they wanted to. There are all kinds of people, all kinds of people who have wanted to hear what you've heard and they've never heard it. But they still believe. Circumstances have nothing to do with whether or not you'll believe. That's what Jesus is saying. Your circumstances don't force faith. Now, an honest person, I'll be, I, think, I think the Apostle Paul was an honest guy. He was a terrible fellow, but he was honest about it. And when he met the Lord on the road, he saw and he said, Okay, I've been blind, and now I'm really blind. But he saw for the first time in his life. Didn't he? I believe he had a heart to believe. A heart to receive Jesus. What about you? What about you? A person who doesn't want to hear will always have a reason, will always have an explanation, and he'll never be right. Never be honest about it. A person who has a heart to believe will see truth, will hear truth, and he'll be blessed by it. Because he has a heart to be. And Jesus explains to his disciples that that's a choice. Aren't you glad for that? Wouldn't it be terrible if you were excluded by God and you couldn't do anything about it? Wouldn't that be a terrible place? I believe if I could. Boy, what a lie that is. You believe if you would. But you will not. Because truth is truth. You may be here today and you'd say, Pastor, you're not very intellectual, and I'll agree with you. You say, Pastor, your, your, your messages are long-winded and it takes you forever to say something simple, and I'd agree with you. But you could get truth today if you wanted to. And it has nothing to do with the messenger. It has to do with the facts that truth is truth. You could be here today and you could have all kinds of reasons, any kind of reason not to receive truth. And you will not. You won't be honest about your reason, though. Because the reason is because you don't wish to. It's a choice of the will. Where do you stand today? Have you received Jesus as your Savior? Have you not been able to get beyond the, well, I don't really know what the truth is? If you want to, you could. But you'd have to be all in. You'd have to be willing to commit to the truth. You'd have to have ears to hear and eyes to see. And if you'd have ears to hear and eyes to see, you'd get it. You could be a believer and you could be here today and you could slip into the same attitude of the individuals that saw and didn't perceive and heard but didn't hear. Please understand what we're saying this morning. Jesus said that's because of your choice. That's a decision you made. You determine that's what you would do. And based on your determination, that's what you'll receive. Do you want something from God? You ought to. Do you need something from God? You certainly do. Will you receive something from God? The choice is up to you. Father, thank you for the truth. God, I pray that we would be like the disciples who are blessed by what we hear. That we'd be challenged by the truth and that we would be committed to it so that what we hear and that what we see affects change in our lives and helps us to know you. God, I pray if there's an individual in this room this morning that does not know Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the time when they would say, you know, being honest about it, the questions that I've had haven't been honest questions. They have been accusations or they have really just been a manifestation of the unwillingness of my heart to believe. But if God will allow me, I'll see truth and I'll live it. If that's you here this morning, right now you can make that decision, that commitment to God. If you're here this morning and you would be a believer who would actually want to
to not hear some truths because of the effect it would have in your lifestyle or your actions or your commitment to God. You'll overlook truth because you're not wholly committed to God. But if you'd like to, you could open your eyes and open your ears and God will work change in your life. And you'll be blessed by it. I'd like to have everyone keep their heads bowed and their eyes closed before we finish praying. I'd just like to ask a question, two questions simply this morning. I'll try to be as clear as I can about them. first one would be this. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and you've realized that it's not because that you couldn't believe, but that it's because you've never made a decision that you're going to believe in Jesus. If that's you here this morning, you'd say, you know what, Pastor, God showed me that. Nothing brilliant that's been said here today, but the truth of it is inescapable. It's, it's profound, and I acknowledge it. If that's you here this morning, would you slip your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I realize that the reason I have not received Jesus is not because I could not, but because I was unwilling to receive Him. Slip your hand up. Second question would be to those who have received Jesus as their Savior. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor, sometimes truth is foggy to me. It's vague and it's distant. Sometimes I read a passage like the one we looked at this morning and as simply as Jesus explained what He was saying, I can read right over it and not even grasp it. I think that the reason God's showing me is that if He gave me truth, I'd have to act on it and I'm not willing to act on all truth. If that's true of you here this morning and you'd say, you know what, pray for me, God's speaking to my heart about this. Just slip your hand up. Say, Pastor, pray for me. God's speaking to me about how I receive truth. Okay. I'm just going to take a moment before we conclude our service and our prayer. Give you just an opportunity to, to tell God what you've told me. You can say something like this, God, I want truth. And you've shown me specifically areas in my life where I'm blind, but I'm blind because I wish to be. And I want the blindness to go away. There are areas in my life where I'm deaf to truth. And I'm deaf because I wish to be. And I want the deafness to go away. I'm making a decision to be open, to see and to hear truth. You just prayed that to God, my friend. Would you, would you follow up on it? If you need help, if you need, if you have an area where you need some Bible answers or some additional counsel, I'd be happy to have the time to discuss that with you at any time. Would you commit that to God? You'd be amazed at what a heart's attitude of belief will accomplish regarding you seeing God work. God, thank you for what you've done in our service here today. Thank you for the way that you've spoken to us. And I pray that you would prepare us for more truth because of our responding with hearts to hear because we have eyes to see and ears to listen. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Before we dismiss our service, let me once again thank you for being with us today and encourage you to tell others. We, of course, have a 6 o'clock service this evening. And you're... That we all of our services are preaching services, including our Wednesday evening service. And if you're not here in each of the services, you're missing. You're missing out on a lot of things uh, that the rest of us are in on. Sometimes I think that we don't consider how much influence the world has on us in a week and how little influence the Word of God has on, on us in a week's time. And if you would balance, if you would balance the preaching of the Word of God with maybe watching the news, you'd be amazed at how much God could do in your life if you got as much preaching as you got news in a week's time. News has never edified me. I don't know about you. I, I found out things, but afterward I think I wish I didn't know that. But you know the preaching of God's Word does. And that's why we have preaching. That's why we don't meet just for 45 minutes on a Sunday morning, but we have teaching in Sunday school. And we have a preaching service Sunday night. And we have a preaching service Wednesday night is so that we can have you exposed to as much to counteract what the world's trying to bombard you with in a week's time. So thanks for being here this morning. It's a delight to have you. If I can be of a help to you, I would count it a privilege. I'm always available. And so God bless you. You're dismissed.